In this next lecture, we're going to discuss a condition called bronchiectasis, and we're going to discuss some of its associated conditions. Bronchiectasis is defined as a disease of chronic destruction, remodeling, and dilation of the large bronchi in the lung. While quite uncommon, it is a permanent anatomic abnormality that cannot be reversed or cured. Therefore, delaying its progression is of utmost importance. This is a picture of a diseased lung with bronchiectasis. As you can see, the large airways are extremely dilated. Again, this is a result of chronic destruction and remodeling of these airways into larger and less effective bronchi. By far, the most common cause of bronchiectasis is cystic fibrosis, which represents 50% of cases of bronchiectasis. Other causes include infections, these include tuberculous and non-tuberculous mycobacterium, in particular MAI, pneumonia, most commonly staph or repeated aspiration, anything with panhypogammaglobulinemia or an immune deficiency, foreign body or tumors, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, also known as ABPA, collagen vascular disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, or immodal cilia syndrome, also known as cartagenar disease. The bottom line is that all of the above mentioned conditions result in repeated and persistent lung infections. These repeated and persistent lung infections cause destruction of the large airways, which results in their remodeling into larger and more dilated airways. So again, any condition that causes repeated and persistent lung infections can cause bronchiectasis. As we've seen before, USMLE Step 2 likes to ask you about the best initial test for a given disorder. In the case of bronchiectasis, this would be a chest x-ray, which shows dilated and thickened bronchi, sometimes with a tram track sign, which is indicative of thickening of the bronchi. However, the most accurate test for bronchiectasis would be a high-resolution chest CT. And the general rule of thumb is that sizable airways, those consistent with bronchiectasis, are going to be larger in diameter than their corresponding adjacent bronchial arteries. On your screen now is an example of a high-res chest CT showing bronchiectasis. As you can see, the large airways are extremely dilated and they are indeed larger in diameter than their corresponding bronchial arteries. Remember, bronchiectasis is not a diagnosis that can be made without imaging. You must have some supporting imaging, usually a chest CT, in order to diagnose bronchiectasis. In addition, sputum cultures are often useful. Again, that is because different diseases causing repeated and persistent lung infections are those that cause bronchiectasis. In order to stop these infections and to delay progression of the disease, you must know what type of bugs are causing these infections and treat them with appropriate antibiotics. Moving on to the management of bronchiectasis, the first step is chest physiotherapy, which involves cupping and clapping of the lung, as well as postural drainage. This is essential for dislodging plugged up bronchi. In addition, you should treat each episode of infection as it arises. By treating the infection, you're preventing it from causing this destruction of the large airways, which, if untreated, will eventually result in remodeling and dilation of the large airways. The antibiotics are generally the same as those for COPD exacerbations. The only difference is that sometimes inhaled antibiotics do have some efficacy in treating bronchiectasis. Lastly, surgical reception is another option. This is only reserved for the most severe cases and for those with focal lesions. At this point, let's discuss two of the most common causes of bronchiectasis, the first being ABPA and the second being cystic fibrosis. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is a hypersensitivity disease which involves an allergic reaction to fungal antigens that colonize the bronchial tree. 
This occurs almost exclusively in patients with asthma or with other atopic disorders. Things to look out for would include an asthmatic with recurrent episodes of brown flecked sputum and transient infiltrase on chest x-ray. In addition, the clinical presentation is often cough, wheezing, hemoptysis, and on imaging, evidence of bronchiectasis. Supportive diagnostic tests also include the evidence of peripheral eosinophilia on a CBC, skin tests with reactivity to the aspergillus antigen, precipitating antibodies against the aspergillus antigen on a blood test, elevated serum IgE levels, and a pulmonary infiltrate seen on either the chest x-ray or the chest CT. During an acute flare of ABPA, the optimal treatment is oral steroids, such as prednisone. Inhaled steroids are not effective for ABPA. Because this has a fungal etiology underlying the allergic reaction, using itraconazole or voriconazole can be useful in the situation of recurrent episodes. Remember, an inhaler cannot deliver high enough doses of steroids to be effective in ABPA. In addition to ABPA, cystic fibrosis is the other major cause of bronchiectasis that is most commonly tested on the USMLE Step 2. Cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disease that results in a mutation for the gene for chloride transport. The most common is the CF transmembrane conductance regulator, or CFTR. Mutations in the CFTR gene damage the chloride and water transport across the apical surface of epithelial cells, and this occurs in exocrine glands throughout the body. This gene is located on chromosome 7. Because chloride and hence water transport are impaired in this disorder, any exocrine gland in the body that involves the secretion of mucus is not going to work appropriately. Without enough water being secreted, the mucus becomes too thick. Abnormally thick mucus results in multi-organ dysfunction, including generalized growth failure, secondary to malabsorption, and vitamin deficiency states, in particular fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. In the nose and sinuses, patients with CF often develop nasal polyps and sinusitis. Again, the mucus here is abnormally thick, which is a great setup for bacteria to cause an infectious bacterial sinusitis. In the liver, there's evidence of hepatic steatosis, and in the worst case, portal hypertension. In the gallbladder, biliary cirrhosis, neonatal obstructive jaundice, and cholelithiasis can occur. The organ most commonly and most severely affected is the lung. Bronchiectasis, recurrent bronchitis and pneumonia, hemoptysis, pneumothorax, and in the worst case, pulmonary hypertension and right-sided heart failure can occur. Patients with CF also have higher rates of ABPA. Lastly, in the heart, right ventricular hypertrophy and pulmonary artery dilation can occur if the patient's lung disease reaches an end stage. In the bones, patients with CF will sometimes develop hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, a condition that can actually be seen in a variety of lung disorders. This sometimes results in clubbing of the fingers. Patients can also have arthritis, and in cases of severe vitamin D deficiency, osteoporosis. In the intestines, Infants with CF are often born with meconium ileus. This is a result, again, of poor exocrine function in the gut and abnormally thick stool upon being born. Throughout the rest of life, other complications can include rectal prolapse, intussusception, volvulus, appendicitis, and bad hernias, in particular inguinal hernias. There is hypersplenism, GERD, and lots of pancreatic disorder. These patients are subjected to repeat episodes of pancreatitis, insulin deficiency, symptomatic hyperglycemia, and in the worst case scenario, frank diabetes mellitus. 
All of this is because both the exocrine and endocrine portion of the pancreas stop working in patients with CF. Lastly, reproductive abnormalities are also common. Infertility, usually because of aspermia or the absence of vas deferens, is common in men. From a female perspective, amenorrhea and or delayed puberty is sometimes seen as well. Focusing briefly on the lungs, the bronchiectasis that you see is a result of damaged mucus clearance. With such thick secretions, it's very difficult for these patients to get the mucus out of their airways. When it sits there in a static nature, bacteria can build up, and it's very difficult for patients to clear these organisms from their lungs. Also, the neutrophils and cystic fibrosis are going to dump tons of their DNA into these airway secretions, trying to fight infection, but without the ability to clear the secretions, all that really happens is that the DNA builds up and further clogs the airways. This is a picture of a normal airway. As you can see, the airway wall is thin and the diameter is normal. Also, the thin layer of mucus lining the airway is very easy for this patient to expel. In a patient with CF, you can see that there is a whole lot of thick, sticky mucus that is basically obstructing the airway. In addition, because of these repeated infections, the airway widens and remodels and bronchiectasis occurs. There's sometimes blood as a result of destruction of the bronchial arteries, and bacterial infection will form because the patient is unable to clear their secretions effectively. With regard to clinical presentation, you have to remember that this is not just a disease of pediatrics. In fact, over one-third of CF patients are going to present as young adults. You should look for a young adult with chronic lung disease, somebody who's had repeated infections from a young age, cough, sputum, hemoptysis, bronchiectasis on imaging, and wheezing are often common in patients with CF. Dyspnea can be seen in the more severe courses, and you have to remember that patients will always complain of recurrent episodes of infection. It may be pneumonia, bronchitis, sinusitis, or any combination of those. Sinus pain and polyps are particularly common on physical exam. To reiterate, there's also pretty severe gastrointestinal involvement in some patients with CF. Meconium ileus is when infants are born with abdominal distension. Pancreatic insufficiency in 90% of CF patients, resulting in steatorrhea, and vitamin A, D, E, and K malabsorption. Remember, those are all fat-soluble vitamins, so if lipase is not able to be secreted effectively from the pancreas, it's going to be very difficult to absorb both fat and fat-related vitamins. Recurrent pancreatitis, distal intestinal obstruction, biliary cirrhosis as a result of inability to move bile through the bile ducts. And it's important to remember that in the pancreas, the islet cells are often spared. Beta cell function will remain normal. However, we've already mentioned that some patients will go on to develop diabetes. This is not a result of direct destruction of the beta cells by cystic fibrosis. Rather, it's a result of recurrent pancreatitis over time that eventually spreads out and will affect the endocrine portion of the pancreas simply by repeated episodes of inflammation. The GU involvement in CF will leave men infertile and 95% of these are because of azospermia. However, the vas deferens are just missing in 20% of men with CF. The women lose their fertility because of chronic lung disease that alters the menstrual cycle and patients have thick cervical mucus that really does block the ability of sperm to enter into the uterus. If, on step two, you are asked about the most accurate test to diagnose CF, the answer would be an increase seen on the sweat chloride test. Patients are given pilocarpine, which increases acetylcholine levels. Acetylcholine levels are going to cause increased sweat production. The chloride level is then checked in the sweat, and if it's greater than 60 milliequivalents per liter on repeated testing, 
you have established a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. Genotyping is not as accurate as an increased sweat chloride level. And this is simply because there are literally hundreds and hundreds of mutations that can result in cystic fibrosis. Once you've made the diagnosis of CF, it's critically important to obtain sputum cultures on these patients, particularly when they're having a bad flare. Non-typable H flu, Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, and Burkholderia cepacea are the most common organisms and the ones that are most prone to develop resistance to your antibiotics. Therefore, repeated sputum cultures are particularly important to make sure that the antibiotics you're administering are effective against these very, very highly resistant bugs. Treatment of cystic fibrosis mostly consists of antibiotics. You must try to eliminate colonization, although this is very difficult, in particular with Burkholderia cepacea, a bug that we just listed on the previous slide. Sputum cultures are needed to guide therapy, and sometimes inhaled aminoglycosides, such as tobramycin, are usually given to patients with CF only. These are rarely used outside of the setting of cystic fibrosis. Sometimes recombinant human DNAase, or recombinant human deoxyribonuclease, is given as well. This helps to break down massive amounts of DNA in a respiratory mucus that clogs up the airways. As we've already said, this DNA is a result of an abundance of neutrophils trying to fight infections in this thickened mucus. Also, inhaled bronchodilators can be very helpful, in particular in patients who have a component of reactive airway disease. Albuterol would be the mainstay of therapy here. And finally, lung transplantation is needed in patients who have become refractory to the above therapies. Lastly, let's end our lecture by discussing the management of gross hemoptysis. Patients with CF will sometimes begin to have gross hemoptysis as a result of a brisk bronchial bleed. These can be life-threatening not because of exsanguination, but because of airway obstruction and asphyxiation. The approach should be the following. Begin with rigid bronchoscopy, and if this is unsuccessful in stopping the bleeding, you must move on to embolization, which is often performed by an interventional radiologist. One key point here, and often tested on step two, is that you should place the patient with their bad lung down. If you turn the patient this way in bed, you're going to prevent bleeding into the healthier lung, which is actually providing most of the patient's oxygen exchange. This concludes our lecture.